bunch of Norman Wurzba. Mm -hmm. And uh, how, and the second panel list is, uh, we're very privileged to have uh, Rabbi Yitbacha Friedman. Uh, she is co-leader with her husband, Rabbi Daniel Friedman. Daniel, why don't you raise your hand? At the Beth Israel Synagogue here in Edmonton. And so we're privileged to have her join us and uh, be part in this conversation on Sabbath, living the Sabbath. And Dr. Alan Effa, he is a professor of intercultural studies here at Taylor Seminary. And uh, he's uh, getting his students to actually use this book in very practical ways in classes as well. So it's been awesome. Um, let me give you some background to, uh, you've heard Dr. Norman words about, but let me give you a bit more background to Dr. Effa. Uh, aside from his faculty duties, Dr. Effa, um, he's taught since at Taylor since uh, 1998, and he oversees our twice weekly cha chapel programs as well, which are a time of rich engagement with the scriptures and the worship life of the church throughout history. And uh, he also has a heart for ministry, having served churches in North America as well as in Nigeria, where he served as a professor at Mambila Baptist Theological Seminary. And his teaching and research interests include mission, evangelism, anthropology, spiritual formation, and African theology. Rabbi Batcha Friedman um, co leads uh, Beth Israel, an Orthodox congregation, as I mentioned, with her husband, Rabbi Daniel Friedman. Um, Rabbi Batcha was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, so I love to get that kind of uh, vigor coming through. She's a graduate of TAE, Torah and Vocational Seminary in Montreal. She received her ESC in mathematics from Brooklyn College, uh, City University of New York, and her MBA at the University of Alberta. Uh, her and her husband moved here in 2002, and uh, she is partnered with her husband as spiritual leader of Beth Israel Synagogue, as I mentioned. She's a certified kosher inspector, and has specialty training in Jewish women's law, and has used that to good effect in uh, just being a leading advocate for uh, women's leadership um, in traditional sense, and we look forward to having her join us as well. Dr. Wurzba, we're already introduced, so why don't you come on up, not come on down. How our time will unfold is that each of the three panelists will. I, I'll give you a microphone here in a second. That's right. Well, I guess you could. Rick, fire him up. Okay. So um, each of the presenters will start by giving an eight to ten minute summation of their reading of uh, sort of where they wish to engage to begin with in uh, Dr. Wurzba's book. Living the Sabbath, and then after that point, they will just engage with each other, and following a time of that, we're going to open it up to the floor for questions that you might have and wish to present, uh, address to any or all of the uh, presenters. So that's our basic process. Uh, so uh, with that, we're going to start with Dr. Wurzba, and then Rabbi Batcha, and then Dr. Effa, and that way. All right, so I'm, I'm really glad for this panel conversation because I'm, I'm especially interested to hear what you all have to say about what I made, uh, or what I said wrongly in the book, so that'll be good. Uh, so I came to write this book totally by surprise because I had been working on another book on creation. You know, I already told you how I think that the doctrine of creation is not simply about how it begins, but what the character and purpose of the world is. And, in doing work for that book, I came across the, the significance of the Sabbath for thinking about the whole of reality. That the Sabbath is what completes the whole of reality, gives it its purpose. And I sort of put that aside and said, okay, there is much, much more to explore here once this other book on creation is finished. And so when that book did get done, I, I started reading a bunch more about the Sabbath and why it's, it's so significant. And I first of all learned that Christians have a whole lot to learn from Jews about religious life. And secondly, I came to learn that there's a reason why the Sabbath is so important for Jews. And it's because what the Sabbath does, besides being a command of God, obviously, is it puts the whole of our living into a perspective which I think is absolutely essential for the flourishing of our life. Uh, I don't know about you, but I grew up in a culture where Sabbath keeping was observed. Right? Farmers did not work on a Sunday. 
it just didn't happen. I mean, you had to feed your animals, obviously. But if you were in the middle of harvest time, and it was Saturday night, when midnight hit, the machinery stopped. And nobody worked all day Sunday, and then Monday morning it began again. And as a youngster, I was glad for that day, uh, because it meant we didn't have to work. But when I think about it as an adult now, I'm astounded by the fact that the farmers did this. Because there were times when the farmers knew Sunday was going to be a good day to harvest and Monday the rain was going to come. So if you're a farmer and you realize that by not working on Sunday you stand to lose several thousand dollars because hay that's been rained on, the quality has gone way down. Okay, this is a, this is a significant issue. And so as I thought about it, I came to realize that the Sabbath, besides being an important religious observance and a practically significant observance is fundamentally also a description of a people's trust in God. The ability of people to recognize that the whole of their living is fundamentally a gift from God to be gratefully received and noted and cherished. And that precisely when people lose their trust in God's ability and desire to provide for us is also the moment when we will use our own fear now and our own ambition to take hold of the world rather than receive the world. And in taking hold of that world, bring about so much of the destruction of the world. So as I started to unpack this insight, I, I came to the realization that the Sabbath is so important because it helps us rethink our position in time. I don't know about you, but for me, almost all the bad decisions I make are a feature of my not having taken time. Either I'm too busy, and so in my busyness I make a choice that I know is not a good choice, or in my busyness I forget to choose to be present to where I am. And so we are in this unique sort of situation where we're mostly passing through life rather than living into life. Because we're just so fast in our pace, in our living. And so, so much of what we know passes us by. And I think a lot of us are aware that in culture we're concerned about the speed of our lives. And so I thought for my remarks this, this afternoon, I would try to give you a different take on the speed of our lives and characterize it as our perpetual restlessness. Sometimes people think that the opposite of rest is work. I want you to think a little bit differently. I want you to think that the opposite of rest is not work, but restlessness. And what's the difference? Well, it works like this. When you are restless, you are convinced that who you are is not good enough. When you are restless, you are convinced that what you have isn't enough. When you are restless, you are convinced that the place you are in is not good enough. That the people you are with are not good enough. And so we end up getting on these treadmills to try to get more, to do more, to be more, however we understand our being. And this, of course, puts us in an impossible position. Do you realize that not that long ago, sociologists were saying that we're moving toward a 20-hour work week? Because it'll only take 20 hours to make the money you need to buy the things that make your life possible. Any of you working a 20-hour work week? I think few of us even stick to 40 hours. And the question is, why? Why are we working so hard, right? The rest of the world thinks we're crazy. And I know you're not American, I live in America, and I know the rest of the world thinks we're crazy. <laughs> and what is it for? Right? And I think what we have to attend to is behind the restlessness that characterizes our lives are, are deep feelings of insecurity, there are deep feelings of 
ingratitude and discontent. And it's not accidental that this has happened to us because the culture in which we live is a profoundly anti-Sabbath culture. It wants us to be unhappy. It wants us to be ungrateful because an unhappy, ungrateful population makes for the ideal consumer. Because if you are convinced that what you have isn't good enough, that how you look isn't good enough, you are in an ideal position to shop your way out of that discomfort. I'm serious. I mean, I have the iPhone 6. Okay? Now, there's a new one coming out. <laughs> Soon, I'm sure. Because Apple wants you to think that if you have the Apple Phone 6, when there is now going to be the 7 or 8 or whatever number they come up with next, I will have failed as a human being <laughs> if I don't have the 7. Okay? This is, this is what the economy does to us. And it's not just having to buy new things, it's about wanting to sort of be in a world that we think if we're there, everything will be better. So social media, television shows, they all do this for us. We start to think, if only I could be there with those people, life would be so great. Everything would thrive. And of course, the Sabbath is there to remind us that that's all a lie. Because the Sabbath begins by teaching us that all of that exists, exists because of God's love. And so what we need to learn to do is to become present to that love. Because otherwise, we will pass all of these others by. We won't notice them. And not noticing them, not seeing how the love of God is at work in them, we will forget them. And in forgetting them, will do some damage. So let me give you just one example, and then my 10 minutes will be up, of how this became really apparent to me in the course of our family's life. So you know I'm a college professor. College professors, they like to read books. But I have four kids. That means that when school is finished and my work hours are finished, I gotta come home we got to get kids to all their after-school activities. we got to make dinner. we got to get them through their homework. we got to get them to their music lesson or their drama practice or whatever. And maybe by the time it's 9 o'clock, all of that will be done. And then I can go to bed and I can read for an hour before I go to sleep. This is really important to me. So I have done this. It's 9 o'clock. I'm in bed. And my wife has joined me. All the kids are in bed. I've got four children. So I'm reading, and my two teenage daughters come and sit at the end of our bed. <laughs> so I just keep reading. Because <laughs> I want to read, right? So my wife, Gretchen, she goes like this and says, Norm, our daughters are here. And I said, so, <laughs> I'm reading, right? And she smacks me again. She says, no, your daughters are here. Put the book down. So I put the book down. And our daughters wanted to talk with us, right? How wonderful is that? And so we spent the hour talking about their day, learning what's going on, what's been good, what's not been good. And then it's 10 o'clock, and we're all tired, so I can't read, and we go to sleep. <laughs> Guess what happened the next night? Same thing. Same thing. <laughs> I'm in bed, it's 9 o'clock, I'm reading my book, daughters come at the end of the bed, my wife's looking at me saying, you do not learn fast at all, and she <laughs> smacks me and says, the kids are here. And so I discovered, well, I'm not going to get any reading done tonight either. And we're talking away, and then one of my daughters says, can we get out the funny book? Which in our house is actually four books, because my wife was very smart and decided to write down in the course of all of our early years growing up together, anything that was really funny said by anybody in the household. It's a wonderful thing to do. 
So my wife gets out one of the books and starts reading about things that the girls had said when they were like three and four, and it's hilarious. Well, of course, we're laughing our heads off, and my two boys who are in bed, they come into the bed. <laughs> so there's six of us now in the bed, and we are laughing our heads off about how wonderful this family can be. That Sabbath. Because... You know, it wasn't a prescribed time, but it was a time apart from time where we learned to be present to each other and see in each other the love of God at work. And now my girls, they're gone. We don't have that time at the end of the bed. I can't be present to those girls like I was in those years. And so Sabbath, yes, we need to have regular Focus times where we stop so that we can attend to the love of God at work in the world. And if we don't have that, if we can't learn to have that sort of time in the midst of all of our restlessness, I think we're going to not just let the gifts of God pass us by, but we'll end up with this habit of negligence, which is irreligion, I would say. So I'll stop there. We can have more conversations, so I think we were next about you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rosba. Thank you, Ralph, for inviting me to join in this panel. Thank you, Dr. Effa, as well, to be here. It's truly an honor. I'm humbled by, by all your great work. So for two centuries, the Israelites were slaves to Pharaoh, to Pharaoh in Egypt. Day in and day out, they worked with back-breaking labor, building the Egyptian cities, constructing the pyramids of Pitom and Ramses. There were a few exceptions, the most famous being the young Levite, Moses, who was pulled from the Nile as a baby and grew up in the palace of Pharaoh. One day he goes out and sees the plight of his brethren, recognizing that given their circumstances, they had no time for spirituality in their own lives. Moses turns to his adoptive grandfather, Pharaoh, and says, wouldn't it make sense to give the slaves one day off a week from their work? Doing so would refresh them and make them even better workers, more effective throughout the remaining six days. Pharaoh agreed, and thus was born the National Sabbath Day. Dr. Wurzba, it was invigorating to read how you incorporate the Sabbath in all aspects of our lives. Your description of living the Sabbath life has many similarities in the Jewish faith. In fact, when I wake up in the morning, I say modeani. I say a prayer. I give thanks to the one above for returning my soul from my deep slumber. Before I go to sleep, I say the Shema prayer. I declare that he is one. And before I eat the kosher food, I say a blessing, thanking God for giving me sustenance. We have laws on slaughtering animals, being kind, in the most humane way possible, which is the least harmful to them. We also have laws about the environment, to not be wasteful. We have laws about being kind to widows, orphans, and how to deal ethically in business. In short, living the Sabbath is the ultimate way to live one's life. But if we are living the Sabbath throughout the week, what makes the Sabbath day unique? Let's talk about God's instructions to the Israelites to keep the Sabbath. It all begins with the giving of the Torah. Moses tells the Israelites that he will go up to Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, and he will return with the tablets from God. The people waiting, and they wait, and soon grow impatient. And so they build a golden calf. Moses comes down from the mountain, and in shock and disbelief, he drops the tablets, and they shatter. He turns to God. As you can imagine, God is furious. How could they do this to him? He took them out of slavery from Egypt, showed them miracles, and they have the audacity to create and worship a piece of stone? He is ready to destroy them. But Moses pleads with him and asks God to forgive them. And so God, God of forgiveness, 
says, okay, but as an atonement, let's build them, let them build for me a tabernacle. Instead of using their constructive drive for the bad, let them use it for the good. The tabernacle was like a pop-up temple that would travel with them throughout their journeys in the wilderness and for the early years of their dwelling in the land of Israel. The Israelites were overjoyed for their second chance. They realized they erred when Moses came down, and they felt remorse. They now have the opportunity to make it up to God. They gather all the materials necessary to build the tabernacle for God, their God. They, they gathered their gold, their silver, their precious stones, the wool, the linens. They're all fired up and ready to begin building when Moses suddenly stops them. Exodus 35, verse 1. And Moses assembled the entire assembly of the children of Israel and said to them, These are the things that God commanded to them. For a period of six days work may be done, but the seventh day shall be holy for you, a day of complete rest for God. Whoever does work on it shall be put to death. Wait a second. Why is this commandment of keeping the Sabbath wedged in between the gathering of the materials for the tabernacle and the actual building of the of it. Our sages, our sages explain this with a parable. They say there was a king who wanted to build a beautiful palace. And he spends every waking hour designing it and creating this masterpiece. He travels the world to find all the materials, the special stones, the special materials that are needed to build this gorgeous place. The queen turns to him one day and asks, well, what about me? Seems like all you ever do now is work on this project. Where do I fit in all this? The tabernacle was very dear to the Israelites. It was their atonement for their betrayal to their God. It was their opportunity to reconnect with him. They were all excited to build, but then God tells them, six days you shall build it, but the seventh day you shall build on our relationship. However holy the tabernacle was, it does not supersede the Sabbath. Sabbath is even more special to God. It is our time with Him, and we must not desecrate it, even if it is to build His holy temple. Six days a week we build. We make this world into a tabernacle. But work must stop on the seventh day. Keep the Sabbath day holy. Connect with God, with your loved ones and your community. Sabbath is about bonding with each other in all aspects. But shouldn't we be working on our relationships all week long? What makes our Sabbath day holy? What makes it unique? So let me describe to you my Sabbath. You know, Ralph was kind enough to invite me for dinner after the lecture. But unfortunately, I had to decline because at 7.22 p.m. this evening, I shall light the Sabbath candles, and that will be the last time I will strike a match, turn on electricity, drive a car, cook, bake, watch TV, answer the telephone, check my emails, Facebook, do any work until Saturday night after the stars come out. You see, in Judaism, we are given guidelines on how to make the Sabbath holy, to bring rest, menucha, and delight. We have many laws regarding the Sabbath. Actually, the Sabbath laws comprise one of the largest tractates of the Talmud. Sadly, so many Jews don't keep these laws because they see them as a burden. I would like to now return to my early story about Moses and Pharaoh. When we bless our wine on Sabbath, we declare that Sabbath is both a commemoration of creation and the Exodus. How is it a commemoration of the Exodus? Because it was our first step to freedom. After the Egyptians are smitten with the ten plagues, we walk out as a free nation. One day a week, we are reminded that we are free from the constraints of work, from the constraints of telecommunication, from the constraints of social media, and from the constraints of the physical world around us. But just like our democratic system, religious freedom requires guidelines to teach us and instruct us on how to be free. 
how to create that space called freedom. Why do most Jews not observe Sabbath? Because there are just too many rules. But what they don't appreciate is that God didn't give us rules. He gave us tools. Tools to be free. These tools are guidelines that offer us opportunities to connect with him, with our loved ones, and our community. Keeping the Sabbath is about unplugging from the rest of the world, unplugging the iPads, the emails, the Facebook, the phone, disconnecting from this world and connecting to the next. What makes living the Sabbath day a unique experience above and beyond our experience when we live the Sabbath throughout the week? Six days a week we are building God's tabernacle in this world. But on the sa Sabbath day, we are teleported to a heavenly realm where we build our relationship with him. I would like to conclude with a blessing to you all that you live the Sabbath in every aspect of your week, but that one day each week, whether that's a Saturday or Sunday, <laughs> you don't just live the Sabbath, but you Sabbath your lives and the lives of your family members and community members by becoming one with them and one with the Almighty. Amen. Thank you, that was very inspiring. I'm really glad my integral mission students are here because next week we're talking about interfaith dialogue and the value of listening and learning from other faiths and, and the truth that can enrich our own practice and understanding of God. So thank you for that. My, my students have also been sharing devotionals at the beginning of each class from a different chapter from the book. So it's been delightful for us to, to engage with your material, Norman. I, do, I want to follow up more from the perspective also of the, the weekly gathering as Christians and this, this day we call Sabbath and how it shapes us to become Sabbath living people. Uh, the thrust of your book calls for a complete reorientation of our lives with the reorientation of priorities and values. And many of the suggestions that I hear you are putting forth appeal to humanity's deepest yearnings and the collective sense of what is right. But of course they go against the grain of our economic system built on ever-increasing growth and consumption fueled by advertisement and dependent on our collective feelings of dissatisfaction and insatiable greed. You raise important questions about our food production system that values productivity and efficiency over long-term sustainability, respect for the land, and the dignity of non-human species. You call for a different way of organizing life in contrast to the frenzied pace and idolatry of productivity that are so characteristic of our culture. And in many ways you are cherishing values that are shared by some of my atheist friends. But you're grounding these values in a solid theistic moral framework that portrays our world as God's creation, in which God takes great delight, and where our rest is a participation in God's Sabbath rest. You articulate an ethical basis for action within such a framework that is intellectually satisfying and superior, in my view, to any other kind of ethical narrative, something which you argue so well in your more recent book, From Nature to Creation. These are basic theological themes around which our Judeo-Christian thinking and praxis should be confidently oriented, and yet surprisingly absent in much of our expression of faith today. How can we recover the ground that we have lost along the way? We were speaking at lunch about how these themes of the sac sacredness of creation, our relationship with the non-human creatures was so prominent in Celtic Christianity and in St. Francis and in the teachings of Irenaeus. How can we start to, can, how can we rethink and repent in the sense of making a new start and moving in a new direction. I appreciate your extension of the concept of Sabbath to multiple dimensions of life as a manner of viewing the world rather than seeing it as a religious observance reserved for a specific day of the week. 
Nevertheless, the practice of weekly corporate worship should be deeply formative of our spirituality and help to shape us as a Sabbath living people. The regular rhythm of gathering in order to be sent out is again is essential for developing a Sabbath living mindset. The dilemma facing the church revolves around how much to be prophetic, to be an alternative culture on one hand, and to accommodate and provide religious goods and services in ways that suit people caught up in the individualistic frenzy of our mainstream culture. And as the church finds itself increasingly marginalized in our post-Christian society, I see a preference for uncritically embracing the predominant culture over a prophetic countercultural stance. What would Sunday mornings look like if we were serious about gathering and forming people who find delight in God's creation and seek to simplify their lives and make ample space for God by pursuing Sabbath rest? Sabbath, as you have defined as a contemplation of the beauty of creation as the manifestation of God's love. Much church architecture is designed with technology foremost in mind, so that sanctuaries have become dark windowless theaters, ideal for projecting <coughs> images, but sequestered from any sight lines of the creation that envelops us. What should be a formative time of corporate worship that whets the appetite for Sabbath rest has become a noisy and busy affair with myriad adrenaline-inducing activities crammed into a 75-minute time frame so that worshipers can be out promptly and chase their agenda-packed hours during the remaining day. Or, as in the case of churches with multiple services, so we can get, up, get set up for another 75-minute production. Some missional church voices like Reggie McNeil even question whether the corporate worship gathering is a viable service the church should be providing. He suggests in his book, Missional Communities, The Rise of the Post-Congregational Church, that the congregational form of church is a relic of an era that no longer fits the current cultural climate. The American lifestyle has changed in a number of ways. In the area of employment, for instance, there are many whose jobs follow rhythms that are at odds with church attendance. People in hospitality and healthcare industries, police and fire departments, entertainment and public utilities, to name a few. Additionally, millions of Americans who do not work on weekends but must spend their days off visiting children of ex-marriages or at their children's hockey or soccer games. He laments the fact that despite these realities, the church continues to invest much energy in the Sunday morning production. He believes that the way forward is some kind of post-congregational church or the proliferation, proliferation of missional communities who reach people who are deeply embedded into a culture that is rapidly moving away from traditional spiritual practices and organizational forms of religious pursuit. This requires, quote, coming alongside their life rhythms rather than requiring them to adopt a new lifestyle and rhythm to match existing church practice. McNeil observes that the people today do not order their lives around the times their favorite TV programs are shown or when concerts are broadcast on the radio. Rather, technology allows them to enjoy them when it is convenient. The same is increasingly true of people's spiritual journeys. Thus, he approvingly suggests that these missional communities should allow participants to customize their spiritual development. In essence, the church needs to find ways to satisfy the individual consumer demands of spiritually seeking Americans who will not make time in their lives for organized religion. Making the gospel more user-friendly and accessible requires an expansion quote, of the bandwidth of how we think church can be expressed in this culture, especially because the number of people susceptible to being congregationalized is dwindling. This strikes me as yet another indiscriminate capitulation to culture, 
that has lost any sense of Sabbath. Spirituality can be reduced to an app that we download onto a smartphone and access in rare idle moments, but has minimal transformational effect on how we order our lives. Philip Kennison, our wall lectures, lecturer last year, presented the model of slow church as an alternative to the blind pursuit of trends that purport to be contemporary and attractive to our culture. If we are going to form disciples with an increased capacity to delight in God, God's creation, and a lifestyle of Sabbath rest, maybe we need to create sacred spaces where we encounter beauty, times for silence, contemplation, shared meals, where we can turn off our smartphones and stop tracking time and learn to live in the Kairos moment of being fully present to God and to others. It might mean encouraging people to begin their Sunday gathering by walking to church or cycling or choosing some other less efficient mode of transportation. It might mean encouraging families to make choices that forego the 7 a.m. Sunday hockey practices or filling every hour of the day with all the activities that were left undone during the work week. It might just mean reimagining the church as a covenant community that gathers, or as an ecclesial community, as you pointed out, that gathers for the sake of the other, where there's mutual sharing toward the end of mutual flourishing, where we come with the assumption that we are there to serve one another, to be available to one another, to look for opportunities to offer hospitality, a listening ear, a caring word. It might mean planning worship services where there are pauses to sit, to be silent, to confess our sins, to enjoy God's presence, to actually meditate on a passage of scripture, to deeply inhale fresh spring air through open windows, without a slavish attention to the ticking of the clock, do you see hopeful signs that the church is awakening to a deeper understanding and practice of true Sabbath living? I just want to hear us here. Yeah. So I, I think I would like to start uh, with a question to you, Bakya, about the Sabbath and its role in contemporary Jewish life. I still think that the best writing on Sabbath is Heschel's book, The Sabbath. It's just a fabulous book. And in it he talks about how the Sabbath is uh, a foretaste of heaven. And when I tell that to, to my Christian friends, and I say, you know, if, if we're trying to live into Sabbath, and by the way, People think that because I wrote a book on Sabbath that I'm like an expert Sabbath keeper. <laughs> no, I wrote the book because I need the book more than anybody else. Okay, so just keep that in mind. So, um, you know, when he, when he said it's a, it's a foretaste of heaven, it then makes us think that surely everybody would crave to live the Sabbath, right? Because if heaven is anything like we might believe it is, it's the place where life is at its best. Right? It's, it's joy, it's peace, it's love, it's all the good that life could possibly be. Why is it so hard for us to do? And I'm, I guess I'm wondering, is Sabbath really sort of the, you know, what's the best word? Is it, is it the thing that above all Jewish people crave? Or are you finding that no, we, we're, you're just like everybody else where we're, we're just struggling? and we're confused, and even though we might think in some sort of corner of our minds that Sabbath really is the solution to everything, we still don't go there. You answered some of the questions in your book as well, right? Um, saying that we're, we're taught, we're, you know, we have to get that iPhone 7. <laughs> yeah. So we, we are um, forced to believe that there's, there's more out there. And 
you know, as Jews, we, you know, as I mentioned, many of them do not keep the Sabbath. So if if it was, you know, if, if it is the taste of heaven, why isn't it? It's a great question. Um, and we, you know, there's actually a song that's, you know, if everyone just kept one Sabbath, the Messiah will come, right? And that's all we need to do is just everyone has to keep the Sabbath, and, and then we will have the ultimate redemption. Um, I think I think why people don't is is because they get lost. They're lost in in the world that we live in. Um, lost with um, whether it's pain, suffering, uh, busyness, you know, work. We just have to do the next thing. But if one actually experiences a Sabbath day, a true Sabbath day of unplugging, um, it's really an amazing thing. Uh, you know, to be honest, the, the it's it's probably hardest for the children um, now <laughs> because they constantly, um, you know, even even in education, as you mentioned, you know, that uh, you weren't so fond of to bring in the um, the iPads in there, but they, you know, you you you, really, you have to and I don't want to say entertain, but really um, be in involved, be connected with them. I mean, that's probably the the challenge. Um, it's not only the adults. Um, I think as adults we can appreciate it more, um, especially in the busy lives that we live in, that we, we're, we're sitting there intimately involved, um, you know, um, part of the Sabbath is, is actually having meals. You know, you mentioned as well, you know, eating together is, 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 is such a fascinating, um, intimate relationship. Um, you know, we always joke that you know, every time there's a Jewish function, there's always food there. And I was like, wow, he finally nailed it. <laughs> this, is why, this is why we have food, because we're supposed to be intimate. <laughs> you know, wherever we go. And so Sabbath is, we're meant to have three meals a day. Um, so we're constantly with each other intimately. Friday night begins, uh, Sabbath day, and then again in the afternoon, on, on Saturday afternoon, we, we, we sit down to another meal. Um, and, and to really connect with each other, uh, connect on all levels. Um, so I'm sure the question is, um, you know, when do you do all this prep work if you can't cook and do anything on, on the Sabbath? So a lot of it's done beforehand, right? So the interesting thing to me is when we had the kids small, we decided that we really need to do something very different on a Sabbath. So we decided that we would have electricity-free Sundays. <laughs> Which, we didn't unplug our fridge or our freezer. <laughs> we don't either. <laughs> We kept that going, but it meant, you know, no television, no lights, right? We didn't use microwave or anything like that, and so it meant that as a family, we were outside, we would play games outside, we had a fire pit in the backyard, so we would roast marshmallows and we roast weenies or whatever we would do for the dinner, and the kids will tell you, they were fabulous, fabulous days. We loved it. But then, the lure of the television, you know, there's a big game on, or the lure of a Facebook page or something, so quickly takes us out of that, even though we would admit that it's some of the best family time that we had, because instead of being distracted by our devices, we were all turned toward each other, you know, talking to each other, eating with each other, playing games with each other, but it's just so hard to keep up. I mean, maybe you've got some observation about that, Alan, I don't know. Give us the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Just nostalgia. <laughs> I grew up in Brazil where everything shut down for, for on Sunday, and it was the day where you just hung out with family, and wow, now to get ourselves to So does to that mean that we have to have a kind of cultural or communal <laughs> sanction for this to happen? I mean, what I, what I so appreciate about Jewish culture is there's a kind of ritual inbuilt into the day, right? That there are certain things that you do, blessings that you say in the course of the day. You know, Christians don't have any of that. You pray when you want to, when it's convenient. And so to think that we ought to have a regular routine, right? That, as Heschel says, the days all lead to the Sabbath and then flow out of it again. We don't have that. And it's like... We're living in a world now where you can't expect a cultural sanction for the Sunday or the Saturday. So, in Brazil, maybe you did. 
but not anymore, right? So I don't know, this is really hard. Yeah. I mean, now, especially with the world that we live in, I think people can definitely appreciate um, the Sabbath. Um, you know, there was a, uh, the chief rabbi of South Africa instituted the Sabbath project, where everybody would experience Sabbath being unplugged. Um, I think it was, it, it even got the, some stars, Paul Abdul to, was Jewish, to also, you know, buy into it, and um, Oprah interviewed, so, so it's gone, you know, a little bit viral about, you know, the, the, the specialty the, um, that, that, that Sabbath brings. And um, again, you know, the, the world that we live in now that is nonstop, with constant, you know, you're always on your phone, and, you know, you don't have, a, you, you're not talking to the person in front of you anymore. Yeah. People are asking, right? I mean, I, there was one time a Facebook uh, day, okay, 24 hours, no Facebook, right? Everybody shuts down. And people couldn't do it. They could not do it. It was like an addiction. <laughs> but it's, it, here it's, this is, this is a divine command. It's like he foresaw what world we we're, gonna, we're going to live in, that we needed this. And so I think even more now, we, we, anybody would appreciate the Sabbath. I think your word addiction is a really good one, <laughs> right? So when people ask, you know, what, what should we do? And I say the first thing you have to do is you have to stop and ask this very basic question, which is what's your life for? Why are you doing any of what you're doing? And the first thing is it's remarkable how little time we take to ask that question with each other. I mean, when's the last time you did this in some sort of rigorous, sustained way where you said, why am I doing what I'm doing? We don't even have time to ask that question. And, and so sometimes I will tell people, do this in a very practical manner where you take a piece of paper and you write down how you spend time every day. How much time are you committing to, to work, to food, and eating, to preparation, to spending time with friends, to watching sports, to Facebooking, to surfing the web, whatever. And then just keep a tally of that for one week and then do the job of adding up the numbers. And when I do this with students sometimes, they're horrified. Because they will discover that if they live 70 years of age, that they will have spent roughly 15 of those looking at Facebook. <laughs> right, think about that. I mean, it's not hard to imagine because you could easily see people spending three, four, five hours a day on Facebook or whatever social media equivalent is the one that you like. And then you have to ask yourself, when you've done that kind of tally, is this really what I want to have done with my life? And then you start to say, well, wouldn't it have been better to have taken some of that time where I was on social media? Not because all social media is evil, I'm not saying that. But wouldn't it have been better if we had taken some of that time and said, let's spend it with friends or family or loved ones or getting to learn something new? Like develop a talent like a musical instrument or something like that so that we could have really cherished the life that we've been given rather than have wasted it doing things that in other contexts we would say to be really that's what we did I don't know I think that's one way to move more practically into what Sabbath is about, because the Sabbath is a teaching that forces us to ask the question, what's it all for? Why do we do what we do? And maybe we don't want to ask that question. What do you all think? You want something you want to say? Yeah, or, they're, or they're just, you know, either too busy or being told what to think, right? They're not, they're not given the chance to think for themselves because they're constantly being fed the information. Um, you know, when Sabbath comes in, I'm like, oh, finally we can turn that off and now I can focus. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to deny it, you know, I'm, a, I'm also on my phone throughout the week and checking my emails and social media and the news and what's not and my kids, oh, mommy, you're always on the phone. No, I'm not one of those. <laughs> So, you know, thank God I have one day a week that I'm not, you know, and I'm completely devoted to them, 
we go to the park, we spend it, you know, when it's warm out in the <laughs> um, and, and, you know, we, we have time to read, and we have time to connect, to discuss, to talk. It's, it's really something valuable uh, that we need to really spread to, to everyone else. Mm -hmm. You know, I think also helps us see that if we're going to become Sabbath people, it's going to be very hard to do as individuals. Mm -hmm. Right? That we're really going to need the encouragement and the support of each other. Because the one virtue of having written this book is that people now can come up to me and say, hey, where's Baha'i you doing on that Sabbath thing? Yeah. And then I go hang my head in shame and try to do better. Right. Now you, you mentioned an excellent point. Uh, it's about community. I mean, you mentioned that we have rituals. Um, and we live in a small Jewish community here in Edmonton, and it's not easy. You know, I, I come, as I mentioned, I came from Brooklyn, New York, which is probably the most condensed uh, Orthodox Jews there. So it was very easy. It was very easy to keep Sabbath there, kosher, being, you know, being a good Jew. In Edmonton, it's a challenge. It's, it's, uh, it's not easy to do things on your own. Um, you know, as far as kosher, you know, that's another whole section, but you know, availability. But you know, focusing on the Sabbath, it's it's about having the community, you know, going to coming together to to synagogue to pray together. Um, we have a, what we call kiddush at following services. Um, it's funny because you know, um, some some people just come for the kiddush and they're called JFK. JFKers, just for Kiddush. <laughs> so they don't come for the prayers, but they come for the Kiddush, you know? And, but that is something, you know? It, it gives them a social, you know, community. It gives them something to come to um, because it's, what, what else would they be doing? You know, it's, if you're by yourself or home, you're just going to flick on the TV. You're going to, you know, find something else to do. So community is huge. It's a huge factor in keeping this out of I do have a burning question that goes along with that, because I've been thinking the whole time since you said that, the sociologist who says we're 20 hour, a 20 hour work week is sufficient, mm -hmm. they don't know about living costs in Edmonton, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> because this is a real class issue too. My husband did work shift work, four days on, four days off, four nights on, four nights off, like his church attendance was like, right, Sabbath, and what do we do, like we don't have this cultural, <laughs> Thing that allows everyone to have a certain day off. Um, how do we help people? How do we make this a not class issue where people in all classes can um, celebrate Sabbath? How, how do you have any solutions for that? Yeah, because well, that's it's a, a real luxury. Sure, that's a fabulous question and it allows us to open up a whole dimension that we haven't even talked about yet, which is that the Sabbath is not just some sort of pious teaching, it's an economic teaching. Okay, and this is so clear, even within the Bible itself, right? Leviticus 25, which where you get a lot of sab sabbatical teaching going on there, it's very clear that the Sabbath is not just for the elites. The Sabbath is for everybody and for the creatures, and it's for the land. And then you've got this teaching called the Jubilee, in which people who, for whatever economic reason, now find themselves to be landless, <laughs> are to be restored to their lands, because land is the place of livelihood. Right? So it's very clear that the Sabbath teaching as it comes to us is a teaching about the right ordering of economic relationships so that everyone can experience right, this time of rest and coming into life with God. And so the dimensions of Sabbath that I think are so hard in our culture is that we've developed the kinds of economies which degrade human life. I mean, think about the numbers of people. You know, I'm, I'm thinking particularly of the American context because that's the one I now know the better, is that we have so many people in America who have to work two or three jobs, and they're minimum wage jobs, they have no benefits, and with those minimum wage jobs, they still are not able to make it. They're living out of their cars. And, you know, you probably have heard that the income gap between the wealthy and the poor is growing exponentially in America. And it's fueling so much of the anger that's present in our election cycle this year. Because people have the sense. They're being left behind 
and life is not getting better for them, it's getting harder for them. And it's a feature of the wealthy siphoning the money, and they're doing it on the backs of poor people. So my point would be, this has to be a church issue. Right? We have to be able to talk about the injustices in our economic orders that prevent people from moving into this kind of Sabbath experience. And I think churches can be of help to each other, you know, short of saying overthrow capitalism, which is not very likely to happen. What if we were to say that churches ought to be working with the people who are being nickel and dimed, who are working multiple part-time jobs? What if we were to try to provide occasions for them to move into this kind of experience by saying, can we help you? Can we take some of the pressure off of your day-to-day -day life so that you can join with us as a community in Sabbath celebration? So that it's not all some sort of individual Herculean effort where because we haven't worked hard enough, we haven't made time for Sabbath. Because, yeah, that's just irresponsible to say to somebody who's working the best that they can to provide food for their kids. And the only way they can do it right now because of the system is to work all these jobs, which means they have no time, no energy for anything else. So yeah, the question you raise is a really, really good one. I just wanted to say a point on that. So. We didn't discuss um, many things on, on about Sabbath, but one of the um, main things um, about Sabbath is that the, the one desecration that you um, you can, the one time you could desecrate the Sabbath is for to save a life. So depending on you know the line of work that one does, um, they can work. So if it's a you know anything medical, a doctor, um, nurse, whatever it is that needs to save a life, they, there are. Um, rules that are, that are valuable for that. Um, as far as um, finding work, you know, that, that works within the six-day week or five-day week, um, the, you know, the, back in the day, the, the old uh, religious Jews came, when they came to America, he, every week, he used to switch jobs. He used to work until the Friday at sundown, and then he said, I'm sorry, I can't work anymore. It's my Sabbath, and he got fired, and he would go ahead and find the next next job on the following week, and this would happen. I mean, this is what he, you know, somebody who was religious and believed in the Sabbath. Um, now it's a lot easier. Um, you can get a letter from the rabbi <laughs> to explain your religious observance, um, and people are more understanding uh, to respect um, your tradition and your values of, of of what that, uh, you know, your way of life. So it's just about asking sometimes. Hi. I have a question. Um, I've always thought of the Sabbath, well, more recently as a Christian, that living the Sabbath involves living in Jesus as our Sabbath because he has fulfilled righteousness and we're no longer bound to the law and we don't have to strive to be good enough for him. And I'm sorry I haven't read your book, but do you address that at all and have any tips for how we apply that in the daily grind of life? Yeah. Okay, so your, I think your question has several elements in it. You know, one of them being that, yes, in Christian tradition, Jesus is considered to be something like the fulfillment of Sabbath. And I think what's fascinating about that is that it's not that Jesus puts in place some sort of anti-law way of living, but that he shows us what the law looks like. So it would be inconceivable, in fact, to say that human life can flourish apart from law. We have to have orders and rules by which to live, and I think we have to get over the caricature that many Christians have, which is to say, you know, Christians, we're beyond the law because of Jesus. No, we're not. It's just that the law has been now reinterpreted in the kinds of life that Jesus shows us in his work in healing and feeding and so forth with, with people. And so I think what's remarkable is that as Christians thought about the life of Jesus in his Jewish context, because he was a Jew, obviously, is that they saw in him a fulfillment of the yearning of Sabbath, Right, which is why he was called Lord of the Sabbath by some of these Christians. You know, the idea that if you want to know what a fully realized life looks like in terms of 
living into relationship with God or living into proper relationship with each other, Christians said you should look to Jesus. And so he's in a way a kind of fulfillment. Now, obviously Jews aren't going to agree with that, but this is what Christians came to believe. And so they actually talked about the resurrection as being the eighth day, right? Because it's a kind of putting of the Sabbath on a new sort of kind of footing or something of that sort. So yeah, Christians, they, they clearly had to figure out how does Jesus fit within the Sabbath? Because as Jews, they would have known that Sabbath is the climax. So they had to figure out, well, how is Jesus as their climax related to the Sabbath? This question is for our Jewish friend. Um, you said tonight at sundown you'll begin Sabbath and uh, till Saturday uh, at sundown. What part does synagogue play in that? And do all Jews go to synagogue? Is that the Kiddush yeah. you're talking yeah. about? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we have um, three services um, during the day. Uh, that's on a weekly basis, uh, in the morning, afternoon, and evening prayers. Uh, so the Sabbath uh, as well, uh, the same applies. So when the Sabbath comes in it's at sundown, it's Friday evening, um, there's the afternoon and evening prayers that are done. And we, have a, we, we have additional prayers for the Friday evening. Um, and then on Sabbath morning, we have the morning prayers, which again has additional prayers. So it's more than the rest of the week. Um, and then after following those morning prayers is when we have that, what we call the kiddush, the um, little you know, food following, uh, sort of a mini lunch uh, following the, the services. And then they return, we return again to, to, to the synagogue for the afternoon services, um, followed by the third meal sometime, what we call the sudat shishit. So Sabbath, you're really at the synagogue three times on a, in 24 hours. Correct. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. a lot of eating. It's <laughs> a lot of goodness. It's a lot of goodness, a lot of intimate moments. Um, yeah, I mean, I, for, for I mean, our congregation, we have about 250 members, and on a Sabbath morning, we have about 120 people there which is quite a lot, considering um, it's small. <laughs> so you go, you go with your family three times? So, so I don't always go. No, we go usually in the morning. Um, so the morning is the main service. Okay. That's when he gets more, um, uh, the, the attendance is more and more, and then the other times are a lot less. And so my other question is for this gentleman here. You were saying about uh, gathering together is getting passe. Now, I want to understand that, that you're saying that it's not passe. We still need to gather together to encourage and to help and love and worship. Is that correct? Absolutely. You're hearing me correctly. I'm, I'm concerned with a trend in some of the missional yes. literature that's saying that Buildings, get Sunday gatherings are passe. It doesn't fit our culture anymore. We just need to make spirituality available for downloads or for individual right. apps. People can find their spiritual attunement on their indiv as individuals. And I'm saying that does not lead to Sabbath living. We need the regular rhythm of gathering, spending time together, where we can help each other flourish in a face-to-face -face environment. Because that's the only way we're going to live out yes. this Sabbath living on a regular basis. And we're cutting ourselves short by accommodating to a culture of immediacy and individuality. Right. Okay, so one last question. I am a children's pastor. And so I'm wondering what the Jewish family does to teach their children at home. About Sabbath, to teach specifically Sabbath? Whenever you teach your children about God. So it's every part of our lives. When we wake up in the morning, um, we wash our hands. Um, we have a ritual to, we have rituals, so um, as little as they can, they wash our hands um, and, and say the prayer of Modani. Um, we say blessings over the food that we eat, so my five-year-old knows her blessings. Um, and before she sleeps um, as well, 
she was just, just the other night, she says, she was saying goodnight to everybody. Sweet dreams, mommy, good night. She's like, good night, Hashem. <laughs> good night, everything that you created, <laughs> you know. Um, I don't know where she got that from, but you know, it was really, you know, something <laughs> from school, I, you know. But it was, it was really, you know, so it's, it's part of our lives. It's, it's, it's so, you know, they, they, they have, um, they go to Jewish schools, so they get that education as well. But it's, we live, we live the Sabbath life. Um, when you live throughout our day, get up. when we get up, when we walk out, I mean, but everything that we do. Uh, question for Dr. Wersner. Sometimes we're critical of other cultures for being incompatible with our Western, liberal, democratic, Judeo-Christian values. And I think part of that is that separation of church and state uh, that we take pride in, and I'm not sure if that's a notion of a render into Caesar. And, and yet, in your work, you, you discuss implementing Sabbath into every aspect of our lives. Is that something that is closer to other cultures, or is it how you view we should be living? Is there, are there any limits on our connection between us as individuals versus the state, or is it all permeating? I mean, Dr. F has spoke about his time in Brazil. Should we be advocating for blue laws to come back, and maybe that's more than one day a week? Yeah. Well, I, I wouldn't try to make uh, something like Sabbath living an imposition on other people. and. The reason I don't want to do that is because the history of Christianity has been a history of imperial imposition. And it's a horrific history that Christians have a lot of explaining to do. And it's, as a result, I think, created a culture now where uh, you can talk about lots of religious traditions, but as soon as you bring up the, ner the term Christian, people automatic, automatically think, oh, you're the ones that forced your faith down somebody else's throat, and you did it by killing them if they didn't do so, right? This is part of the history. And so I would never want to go down the path where we say we're gonna impose by law a Christian vision about how to order your life. But at the same time, I wanna say that as Christians, if the things we believe matter at all, they should permeate the whole of your living, which then has the good chance of putting you at odds with the culture around you that will say, we think you should order your life this way. And so for me, the, the, the key thing is that Christians try to figure out how the very basic commitments that they have can learn to be a witness to the world around them so that people you say, oh, look at those Christians. Isn't it remarkable how they keep Sabbath? We sure would like to learn how to do that because we see that by their living that way, life is better. It would be so great <laughs> if that were to happen. It doesn't happen very much, unfortunately. Sometimes it does, okay? So that we can say that there are examples in history where you know, a faith tradition working out its commitments draws people in by the sheer loveliness and goodness of what they do. It's unfortunate that so much of our history has not been that way. Um, so my, my work is in a way a call to Christians to try to realize what their basic commitments mean and how they could be practically worked out in all of the dimensions of their life. And secondly, it's also an attempt to say to non-Christians, you know, you may have thought this or that about Christianity and thought, wow, these people really are crazy. And I want to say, maybe it's not so crazy because when Christians talk about Sabbath or when Christians talk about the meaning of church, that people would say, oh, that's, that's serious, that's compelling. We should give it a look. That's what I'm trying to do. Thank you. Just to pick up a little further on, on that last comment, um, you would, Dr. Worsman, uh, not like to impose on anybody, but as a Christian, speaking to other Christians, what would you suggest that their Sabbath rhythm look like? Well, there isn't, 
I mean, and I'm serious about this. There isn't going to be a, sort of a one-answer response to that because you have to be attending to the communities in which you're operating and the time in which you're in, the particular cultural context that you're in. So a small rural community is going to present possibilities that a very dense urban center like Manhattan is not. Okay, so the way you will structure and order a life so as to make Sabbath flourish in it really is a feature of where you are. That doesn't mean you just relativize the Sabbath to whatever you want, not at all. But it is to say that we have to recognize that every place has its unique challenges and possibilities, and the same for human communities. And so you want to start by being attentive to that, because as I said earlier, I think Sabbath is fundamentally about being attentive to the world as God's gift of love. And if that's not happening, right, you're just missing out on what the Sabbath is. So practically speaking, I say you start by figuring out who's your community and who's in that community. What are they doing? What are they struggling with? What do they need? What are they not getting? And then as you together, right, and the togetherness is important, start to talk about this, you know, being informed by what Scripture has to say about Sabbath. Right? attending to what we can learn from Jews about Sabbath and ritual forms of life. Together, you work together then to figure out what can Sabbath life look like here, right, right now. And you know, this happens obviously on a smaller scale more readily than a large scale, so I wouldn't say necessarily that a church as a whole try to do this. It may be something that small groups within the, within the church start to do first of all, or Bible study groups where they say, let's, let's do a study of Sabbath, let's commit as a group of you know, 20 people or whatever, to try to say, how would it work for us to try to implement some of these Sabbath teachings in the course of you know, our shopping patterns, our work patterns, how we, how we spend our leisure time, those kinds of issues. And I think when you do that together, reading scripture together in prayer, you will discover possibilities. So it's not me legislating a pattern of life to them, but they together, right, seeing what's possible where they are. Thank you. Uh, maybe I could just ask more specifically. I was hoping for a more specific answer, so maybe I'll just re rephrase. What's your situation, and what does your Sabbath look like? We yeah, what is my situation? Okay. Well... You know, you've already heard I have four kids. Two of them are gone now. Two of them are still at home. One of the very important things that we do in our house is we cook and eat together. It's very important. And it's very hard to do. Because being at Duke, I have an incredibly full life of things that are expected of me to do. And so to make the commitment to be home to cook with my family and then to share a meal together. Uh, that's a really tough thing to do, but we've just made it a priority. So that's one thing we do. Another thing that we do is the practice of hospitality. Right? Partly I learned this from my parents, but partly it's this realization that you can't learn to delight in the world if you never invite the world into your home. And so being hospitable to others and creating the spaces in which they can enter into our life and we can learn about them and help nurture them in their life also becomes a Sabbath exercise. Right? That's really important. Another thing that we do is church. Church commitments are important. Right? So we understand the importance of corporate worship, uh, being serviceable members within a congregation to work in our community to do something to witness to the love of God, right? those become important exercises. So those are just some of the things. Um, I became a Christian through the influence of partly of some Seventh-day Adventists, and I went to a Seventh-day Adventist church for a while. I don't know there anymore. But, Could you um, please speak louder and closer? Thank Sorry, you. That's okay, thank you. I became a Christian through the influence of some Seventh-day Adventists as well as some other things, but um, that was many years ago. I went to Seventh-day Adventist church for a few years and then theologically became aware that there were some issues. But um, I really appreciated 
being having the whole week revolve around the Sabbath. It was not like, oh, we go to church on Sunday morning and then we go out to eat or shop or do other things. It was like the whole week revolved around thinking about when you get your house clean, when you prepare food. Having food ready in, invites hospitality because then you can say to somebody at church who's new or visiting, would you like to come to our house for dinner? And the house is clean, it's not a mess. I don't, I am not practicing that as well as I wish I could, but I know that when I did that, and even when I was going to school, and when I was, you know, using, having the Sabbath be completely a day, I didn't study on that day. I still got all my studying done. I felt like God really blessed that, but it also, the whole rhythm of the week and thinking about that, it was like anticipating this special day where you had the whole day with you and God and other people and family and community. In those years, I had the best relationships with people because I was in their home, they were in my home. It was just like this continual uh, and inviting new people in. It was, it was something that is just not there today. <laughs> and I miss that. And uh, so I, I really appreciate what you're sharing, but I... I also did like having that rhythm, not just hospitality, not just things, but even somewhat like a Jewish rhythm of by um, Friday night, everything was cooked and everything was ready and you sat down and you had a light meal together and you prayed and you talked and, and then at the end of the Sabbath, we had another meal with, usually with friends and you know, we might play games or do something afterwards, but it was just this rhythm, and I think that rhythm is missing in our week when you have 24-hour day shopping, everything going on, and we don't have a rhythm. And I think God created us to have a rhythm. I think you're absolutely right, and you're pointing to the importance of structure. Yeah. Right, structuring our time. I think the structure is important because then it becomes a way of life. If the structure is not there, then it isn't a way of life. It's like you might choose to do it, but everybody else, we're going, now we're going out to eat, we're, we're going to our kids' soccer game, we're doing something, we don't have time to come over. So, but when it becomes a rhythm, then it's a lot easier to be entering into that. No, I, I completely agree with you. I think that's really well done. I want to share one example of a couple that has been really quite exemplary in, in, in doing this. Uh, they had a practice of just letting their three sons invite whoever they wanted to invite after church to come over for waffles every Sunday. It was a simple meal. They just had a bunch of batter that they prepared, and every this was part of their weekly rhythm. They never knew if 20 or 30 people would be around their table. You just add more, more batter. And the number of people that they touched through this offering of hospitality of, of a leisurely afternoon, you could stay as long as you wanted to, uh, strangers would get invited over, uh, it was a delightful uh, model that I vowed to practice but have yet to put into uh, practice, but a simple way of being Sabbath people. Part of, part of the joy of being a uh, pastor, minister for the last 44 years is to see people come to faith. <sighs> but what mystifies me is how they can take Almighty God so lightly. Like I, my question to our Jewish friends is, I sure hope most of your congregation comes to synagogue. Meshit, do you call it, meshit, how do you call it attendance at synagogue? Meshit? There's an M word, is it? No, I mean, I, I'm not remembering correctly. I've been to synagogue once, so I understand there's a, some of the ritual. But anyway, getting people to church, to synagogue on, on Passover is about as important as us getting our people there at Easter. And sometimes, you know, not even that, they don't go, oh me, oh my. <laughs> so I'm thinking, some, what I'm saying, my point is, I guess, is that if we can draw attention to Sabbath and what the meaning is, hopefully, it'll begin to take a better look and allow the, you know, God Almighty to zap them <laughs> with some with some uh, with some reverence, if, if you will. Yeah. No, we definitely um, feel that. I mean, we 
you know, you mentioned Passover, we have other holidays um, throughout the year, um, that the sanctuary is empty. And it's, and it's, it's heartbreaking, especially, you know, coming from New York, I'm like, this is not a holiday. <laughs> Where are all the people? <laughs> and we try, you know, with the food, <laughs> to get them in there, um, which usually works. But um, it's, 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 you know, we're in the same boat. <laughs> Um, you know, you, you mentioned the, uh, the church is um, being a theatrical um, event now. Um, you know, we try to look at maybe perhaps modeling, you know, that sort of thing to try and bring them back into and making it maybe more exciting for them. Um, you know, to, to bring, you know, music and entertainment, um, to, to, to bring them the, the delight of the Almighty um, through teaching as well. Um, you know, we, we, we do the best we can, and you know, but I think it's, um, it's about experience. Um, people need to experience uh, the Almighty's presence to really, to really be able to, to come back, to connect. Yes. I want to just piggyback on that because I think one of the reasons that people don't come to church so much is that they experience church to be a place not of the presence of the loving God, but the presence of judgment and bickering and you know, people, I mean, you all know this. We can be honest. Churches can be places that are just awful. They can be. I mean, I cannot tell you how many people have stopped being Christian, not because they disbelieve in God or they think Jesus is a, is a moral monster. They don't go to church because church people have been vicious to each other and to them. So it's not only in the synagogues. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, you know, churches, I mean, if, if you want to know the real reason for the growth of atheism, it's, it's the church's fault. Because churches for so long have not often shown what the love of God looks like. Because if they did, people would not run away. Nobody runs away from love, really. I mean, maybe there are some who do. But uh, I think that's, that's something churches really have to talk about with each other. Okay. I don't know who this is addressed to, so maybe I can decide. Um, Dr. Eppa, you mentioned that the missional community idea that the traditional congregational setting is kind of, they're trying to kind of shift it. And a part of me feels like that, that kind of resonates. It's very much like you had said, like a, a congregation comes and we listen and we leave, and we want to be entertained. But a part of me identifies with you that it, it, it doesn't have to be um, like an entertainment thing with you know, videos and all that sort of thing, but there's a way to bring in the arts. There's a way to read scripture dramatically. Read the whole book of Colossians. Read the whole book of Peter. Do, do it differently than the way it is being done that can draw people in. I mean, the art, like all of the art that we have over the centuries, like it tells dramatic stories. And if you're visual, you can really meditate on that. And so a part of me feels like congregationally coming and sitting doesn't appeal to some people in a way that they can feel God's presence because it is limiting to just hearing what someone else is saying. And I don't know where the space is to have those conversations that you're saying about how can we maybe help the people that are being nickeled and dimed? Because when I come to church, I hear a sermon, and then I go, and I might be a part of a small group, but I mean, at the end of the day, my congregation and the one I'm tithing to, the church leadership is deciding what we're going to do with that money. And there's not really a space for me to have conversations that you're saying the church needs to have. Yeah, I mean, I... Pastors don't like it when I say this, but sometimes I say, can we just scrap the sermon? I mean that. Like you said. Not always, not always, but can we just scrap the sermon sometimes? Because wouldn't it be so much better if everyone decided to come together and instead prepare and share a meal? And in the course of the preparing and the sharing of the meal, we read scripture, we sing songs, we offer prayers, and let the Spirit do some of the work which I know it was doing in the church I grew up in. I do not remember a single sermon that I heard growing up. 
But you know what I do remember? Is that we ate together a lot. Kaffee und Kuchen. <laughs> that was church. And I'm, and I'm serious in this because what I know happened is that when we had all that Kaffee und Kuchen, people were talking with each other, they were praying with each other, and we were learning about the needs of the people in the community in the course of that conversation that would not have happened if we all just came, sat, listened quietly to the sermon, and then left. Right? And so I tell pastors, do this every once in a while, or do something like this. I, I was talking to a pastor from Ohio last summer, and he, and he said, you know, I'm really at the end of my rope. We're losing attendance, and I'm not sure what's going to happen. And I said, how about if you announce one Sunday that you're not going to have a regular worship service. Just come and talk about who you want to be as a church. And he said, oh, I'm scared to do that. <laughs> I said, what have you got to lose? And he said, okay, I'll try it. So two months afterwards, he calls me and he says, Norman, you're not going to believe it. I took up your idea. And our congregation showed up, and I thought they were just going to bicker the whole time about what they don't like about our church. And instead, they talked about who they want to be as a church. And he said it was the best thing we could have ever done. Because it was the first time that people felt that they had something to say about their church. Who they wanted to be. What they would like to see differently. What they thought was possible that they hadn't been doing before. So yeah, I think you got to get out of the mold every once in a while. And I mean the mold not just in the sense that what's confining you, but the mold that grows when it's not been clean for a while, right? We need to get out of that and just, I mean, we have, this is the amazing thing, God gave us an imagination, and we don't use it. We think we got to have three hymns, three prayers, three offerings, and three-point sermons, and if we haven't done that, we haven't had church, and I don't know, I hope we got more than that. And the arts, yes, you're thinking about the arts, absolutely. The arts are so important. I was just going to say that uh, Ruth Myers, in her recent book, Missional Worship and Worshipful Mission, concludes with the observation that there are two great hungers in our culture for transcendence and community. The 40 minute sermon does not produce transcendence or community. I would like to see that band someday. <laughs> uh, there are so many other ways to help people meet with God than that monologue communication that has become standard in many of our churches. And, and the community, if it's just to sit and look at the backs of people's heads, <laughs> you're not going to experience community, but to come with this idea, okay, we have a, a structured time of worship, but we are here to interact, to meet with each other, to spend time over coffee. I think the, one of the fastest growing churches is the one you belong to because there's a brunch that happens there Sunday morning. So there's already a rhythm there of, of kiddish, of eating together and, and sharing life together over tables. This is a, a, a desperate cry of our hearts. It's also very scriptural, right? You can't read Acts and not realize this is a church that ate together all the time. And because they ate together, in memory of Jesus, we learned the most astounding thing, which was there wasn't a single one among them who had need. And they had joyful and glad hearts. I mean, this is astounding. And it all centered upon eating together in community in memory of Jesus. I just want to say, so, can I just say yeah. something? <laughs> Go for it. I mean, obviously, the, the, um, the structure of prayer is little different. Um, uh, the rabbi gives a sermon, so he'd be out of job. <laughs> but um, having said that, he, he doesn't give a 40-minute sermon, so it's, it's, it's a little different. And, um, and I, don't, I mean, obviously, I'm a little biased, but people actually do come just to hear him speak. <laughs> um, so I think it's important, you know, while we need to be creative um, in, in attracting um, individuals to, to, to receive the delight of, of the Almighty, we have to remember the tradition. We can't, we can't let go of that. And so, while we have prayers that may be boring, and you know, that we listen to it, let, let's try, I think, to be creative in how to make it more exciting for them to listen to. Not to, not to take it away, but to bring it in a, in a different form. Um, 
and and, and to because you know, it's it's important that we don't lose that that tradition. Um, it, we need to do something different, I think, um, but I don't think we, we need to, to, to just remove it. Thank you. So, Ernest, last question, and then we will do what oh. Dr. Wurzba encourages us to do, to eat together <laughs> and to enjoy each other and experience the Lord in our midst. So, Norman, question. you propel me to say a few words. Okay. Um, are we struggling to find pattern for church? John Calvin, as he came out from the Reformation and all the upheaval, I try to make my comments as brief as possible, he struggled. And uh, he struggled with theology, he struggled with the church pattern. You did refer to the early church. They struggled in trying to get a pattern. And I think we are struggling right now, and you have mentioned the word. I worked in a blueprint company years ago, and one of the instructions they gave us is, read the instructions once, twice, three times before you carry out your work. I'm glad you mentioned Mark 228, I believe the lady and you referred to Mark 228. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. Why don't we go back to him and find out the instructions? In other words, what I'm trying to get across is, why don't we bring the gospel back into the Sabbath? I just read a uh, sermon on Spurgeon. I'm writing a second book on Spurgeon right now. And uh, his uh, sermon on Christ lifted up, he hits for me, the nail on the head, that should be the theme of our churches. In other words, uh, the primacy of preaching should not be lost. Eating is secondary. It is good. I like your reference right here, and I wrote a lot of good stuff down right here. It's good um, uh, fellowship. It's good hospitality. It's good, you know, that, um, that uh, goodness. It's goodness. That's the word that is used. That's all fine. But we need to go back, it seems to me, uh, from your reference to Mark 2, 28, sorry for repetition, mm -hmm. to the Lord of the Sabbath and bring him in. Um, anyway, those are just a sure. few comments. Yeah, no, I, I, I get your point, and I, I hope I didn't say that we never preach again in a church. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't say that. I, I'm just saying that we need, to, we need to change things around from time to time. And I certainly wouldn't want to say that we should dispense with teaching in the church, right? Any more than you would say, you know, we don't attend to the Jewish tradition, you know, Torah and Midrash and all the rest, right? These are all very important things for sure. My concern is that there's a kind of model which has a kind of built-in authoritarianism even sometimes in which we tend to elevate uh, particular personalities, right? And you know this. A pastor has a big personality. People show up when the pastor's gone, the church folds, right? That shows you that this is a church that was not built around the Lordship of Christ. It was built around the authority or the personality of the pastor. Okay? And that's a big, big danger. And I think sometimes when we elevate the sermon as the climax of our worship life, we run the risk of really elevating the personality of the preacher. And I want to sort of warn us against that temptation. That does not ever mean that we dispense with teaching or preaching, because we need the teaching and the preaching to teach us about things like what is the gospel? What does it involve? What are its entailments? We obviously need the administration or administering of the, the sacraments, Right, that we do as people who are baptized, who are then nurtured in the faith through the Eucharist. Right? And we have to explain what all of these things mean as we're trying to become a body together. So no to the idea that we want to get rid of teaching or preaching. Yes to the idea that we want to make sure that we communicate these things clearly, but not affix them to a personality. Uh, or to think that Really, in the end, the gospel is about the things that we say only. Uh, that it has to be something that becomes embodied and worked out in our communal life together. And I think too much of our worship doesn't facilitate that. It's looking at the backs of heads.
Well, thank you very much, Thomas. This is a big time. This has been a very rich and engaging time, and I thank you, Rabbi Batya, Dr. Orzba, Dr. Effa, for your preparation, and your thought, and your and engagement, and your invitation for questions. Um, wonderful. I do appreciate that. Helping us really think through what does it mean to be a people of Sabbath rest in many different directions. Uh, so we're going to invite you now to uh, join us in the Commons area for refreshments. We will regather at five minutes before three, five minutes before three, and then uh, Dr. Wurz will lead us in our final session, and you'll have the last final chance to ask questions at the conclusion of his presentation. All right, so five minutes to three.